welcome to the Christian Thought Lecture Series held on the campus of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Today, a number of questions have captured the attention of the media, the academic community, and people in the churches. What is evangelicalism? What is fundamentalism? How do we distinguish between the two movements? What is the future of American evangelicalism in an age so manifestly pluralistic and secular? Have evangelicals conformed their lifestyles too closely to the ethical and moral standards of their culture? How can they witness for Christ more effectively? Christians need answers to these questions. This year, our Christian Thought Lecture Series is entitled American Evangelicalism, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. We are honored to have as our featured speakers two deans of the American Evangelical Movement, Dr. Kenneth S. Conser and Dr. Carl F. H. Henry. Both gentlemen have served as editors of Christianity Today and as co-chairs of the 1989 Evangelical Affirmations Conference, sponsored by the National Association of Evangelicals and by Trinity. For decades, Dr. Conser and Dr. Henry have provided the evangelical community with wise counsel. Their godly lifestyles have added impact to their words. We have asked Dr. Conser and Dr. Henry to share with us their reflections upon the evangelical movement with which they have been so intimately associated. In our first sessions, each of our distinguished experts will speak to us about his perceptions of turning points within evangelicalism during the last 50 years. In later sessions, Dr. Conser and Dr. Henry will also assess what they believe to be the prospects of the American evangelical movement as we approach the end of the 20th century. Now, neither Dr. Conser nor Dr. Henry knows what the other will say. It should be fascinating to compare and contrast the way these two men tell the story of the resurgence of American evangelicalism since the early 1940s. Our first speaker is Dr. Kenneth S. Conser. Dr. Conser received his PhD from Harvard University. He taught for many years at Wheaton College. From 1963 to 1978, Dr. Conser was dean of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He then became editor of Christianity Today. Presently, he continues to work with Christianity Today and to teach at Trinity. Let us give a warm welcome to Dr. Kenneth S. Conser. Thank you, Dr. Woodbridge. What is the evangelicalism whose crucial turning points we are about to examine? Literally, the word means belief in the good news. But what good news? Many things sail under the banner of evangelical, and some of them are certainly not good news, but very bad news. But what is the good news? So far as I know, the first time a movement in church history came to be known as evangelicalism was at the Reformation. It was not that Martin Luther thought he had discovered some new religion, but in his mind, he sought to call the entire church back to its biblical roots. He called his understanding of Christian faith evangelical. As early as the year 1520, he referred to those who boldly called themselves evangelical. In 1522, he noted this common evangelical cause. In 1526, he accepted the label without apology, writing, among us who are termed evangelicals. At one point, Luther declared, evangelicalism is Christianity. Historians have defended this evangelical understanding of Christianity in twofold terms. First, in terms of the material principle or its basic doctrinal content. Put most simply, it is the doctrine of justification by faith, that God accepts us in spite of our sin, forgives us, and receives us as his children, not as a reward for good works at the end of life, but on condition of faith in Jesus Christ, the God-man, our divine 
Lord and Savior. Of course, though they were not always included in any formal statement of this doctrinal content, many other doctrines were clearly tied to justification by faith in Christ, such as the Trinity and the doctrines outlined in the Apostles' Creed. Evangelicalism was further defined by its formal or formative principle of Holy Scripture, that the final authority for our religious faith and life is found in the divinely inspired, completely truthful, and therefore wholly trustworthy Bible. Evangelicals may, and in fact often do, disagree on many important doctrines. But those who hold to these two basic doctrines of biblical and historical Christianity are evangelicals. In practice, this means that those who follow Martin Luther in full commitment to these two principles would be considered evangelical, even though they might disagree with what he taught on many other points. The same could be said for those in the Calvinistic, Reformed, and Presbyterian churches, the Anglican bodies around the world, including Wesley and the Methodists, many of the Anabaptists following Menno Simons, and now most recently, Pentecostals and many Charismatics. Of course, in some cases, anyone who belongs to a denomination stemming historically from any of these movements was called evangelical, even when such a person had abandoned belief in the doctrines essential to evangelicalism. This is especially true in South America, where the word evangelical has become synonymous with Protestant. But evangelicals themselves have never for a moment admitted that such a loose usage of the word evangelical is legitimate. And certainly they have Luther, Calvin, Menno Simons, Hooker, the traditional Anglican, John Wesley, Roger Williams the Baptist, and a host of others on their side. It's true that one can pick or choose what one believes from these two principles, either from the doctrines of the content principle or from the authority principle of the Bible. Many have done just that throughout the history of the church. Depending on which parts they pick and which parts they reject, some might be called inconsistent evangelicals. But that doesn't make it right. The evangelicalism that Luther and all his true followers espoused is the good news set forth by the Bible. It includes a commitment to the teaching of the Bible as God's gracious and trustworthy word for us and to the doctrinal content the Bible sets forth, centering in Jesus Christ and his benefits. This is what we evangelicals believe, and it is a great heritage. Now I should like to note some of the crucial turning points in evangelicalism that I have known and in some cases participated in during the last 50 years, roughly since World War II. However, evangelicalism can't rightly be understood as a brand new movement that appeared on the scene for the first time around 1940. As we have seen, it traces its roots back to the Reformation and indeed through the medieval and ancient churches to the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord as set forth in Holy Scripture. American evangelicalism is embedded in colonial times. Much of what we see in evangelicalism of the last half century can only be understood within the framework of the history of our nation. For this reason, in order to understand better what is happening now, I should like to mention, all too briefly, some of the decisive events in the history of American evangelicalism. This will illuminate many recent turning points in evangelicalism of the last 50 years. The early colonists largely opted for the union of church and state, a pattern set in the European nations from which they had come. Even those like the separatistic pilgrims who had come to America in protest against state control of religion joined with others in uniting church and state. From the start, however, the 13 colonies represented a religious pluralism. When the fledgling nation formed its constitution, therefore, it incorporated a principle of separation of church and state. This was interpreted to mean that the national government could support no religious body. But 
it was generally understood, even by the deist Thomas Jefferson, to allow for government support of religion and religiously grounded morals. In 1838, a new wrinkle was inserted that has had immense significance for our day. Until that time, elementary schools were usually privately controlled by religious bodies, but supported by public taxes. At that time, Roman Catholics demanded that they too should receive tax support for their schools. Protestants didn't wish to support Roman Catholic schools with public funds, so they turned over all their schools to the state and insisted that money could only be granted to publicly owned and controlled schools, intending to continue much of their Protestant religious instruction of the past while continuing to receive public tax support. Thereafter, public schools were generally free to support religion, but more and more religion conceived so as to include any aspect of the Hebrew Christian tradition, Protestant, Catholic, or Jew. And that is the way it remained down until the last generation. On the college scene, another significant pattern developed with ramifications for evangelicalism. Early on, many evangelicals assumed that faith was adequately safeguarded in the Bible or religion department, but it wasn't necessarily to keep other aspects of the school doctrinally sound. Devastating results came upon Christian higher education in America, and that explains in part, in large measure, really, why most colleges founded as Christian schools switched so radically from evangelicalism to liberalism in the short period from 1880 to the First World War. As a result, evangelicals were left without a basis for the educational training of their leaders for the next generation. <laughs> Protestant seminaries and religious departments in our great private universities remained basically evangelical until after 1880. All except Harvard were quite thoroughly evangelical, including Union, Union Seminary in New York City, Chicago University, and many others. Princeton was the last of these older schools to turn away from evangelical commitment. It made its switch in 1929. In view of these and other crucial changes on the American scene, evangelicalism lost its role of religious and moral leadership in our nation. By 1930, the centers of American culture had become solidly unevangelical, if not anti-evangelical. Sociologist David Moberg has labeled this dramatic change the great evangelical reversal. Evangelicals, so it seemed, though there were some splendid exceptions, abandoned the cultural life of America and its great universities and withdrew from the political life of the nation and from public life generally. The public square, so Richard Newhouse puts it, was left naked of a Christian presence, and evangelicalism was relegated in the popular mind to the status of endangered species about to join the dodo and the dinosaur. The 30s, to put it mildly, were not a good time for evangelicals. The heroes providing intellectual leadership for evangelicals in the past had by now disappeared from the scene. Abraham Kuyper, Herman Bovink, Theodore Zahn were long gone. James Orr, the greatest British evangelical thinker at the turn of the century, died in 1913. B.B. Warfield, the greatest American apologist for evangelical faith, died in 1923. J. Gresham Machen, the last lingering leaf of intellectual stature capable of standing up to the liberals and radicals of the 20th century died in my freshman year in college. And there was no one to replace them. On the university campuses of America, InterVarsity had yet to appear. Young Life, Child Evangelism, Navigators, Campus Crusade for Christ, Christian Service Brigade, Pioneer Ministries, and Youth for Christ were not even yet dreams. The breezy writings of Harry Rimmer and the Old Fashioned Revival Hour were about all we had to go on. And they did not offer very solid pieces of meat 
on which to nourish the intellectual life of a young intellectual. When you're at bottom, there's no way to go but up. And in one sense, the history of the last 50 years of evangelicalism is the story of its attempt to rise above the ashes of its nadir point in the 30s. No doubt evangelicalism has still a long way to go. Its advances have been painfully erratic, with many false starts, stupid, ineffective moves, and colossal failures. But it isn't all bad. I'm not an optimist. Reading the morning newspaper at breakfast table is enough to cure the most outrageous optimist. I, I hope I am a realist. But to any doer pessimist, I point out that evangelicalism has not followed the dodo and the dinosaur into the category of extinct species. I haven't heard anyone recently predict that evangelicalism will soon become extinct. <clears throat> what happened? Well, the National Association of Evangelicals was founded, for one thing. That's a start. And the long list of student organizations I cited a moment ago have come into being. The fact that they were mostly what we call parachurch organizations spoils them for some people. But the leadership and hierarchical structure in mainline denominations had become liberal. How else could evangelicals provide leadership for their followers? Followers scattered in many denominations. And generally, these organizations are not anti-church. They are supported by evangelical church members. They secured their initial success in evangelical churches and grew as representatives of the evangelical churches. Evangelical Bible institutes and Bible colleges began to flourish, and a wholly new chain of evangelical colleges and seminaries appeared. This time, not to keep pace with the westward sweep across the continent, but to replace the evangelical colleges and seminaries that had fallen into liberalism. Even a number of older educational institutions that had drifted into liberalism began to reevaluate their birthright and sought to recover their heritage. Bible colleges banded together to create an accrediting agency and two organizations of Christian colleges, the Christian College Consortium and the Christian College Coalition came into being. The rebirth of evangelical seminaries was even more startling. How startling becomes evident by comparing enrollment figures of accredited seminaries in the United States today with those of 30 years ago. As late as 1960, it would have been overly optimistic to affirm that more than one of the 10 largest seminaries in the United States was consistently evangelical. Today, of the 10 largest accredited seminaries, four are Southern Baptist institutions, each of which is more conservative now than it was then. And three other seminaries of the 10 would probably be put in the evangelical category. Moreover, if one were to count the graduates of these schools newly entering into the ministry of the churches, the evangelical numbers are overwhelming. It is no wonder that George Gallup tells us that the highest percentage of conservative and evangelical ministers in any age bracket is to be found among the youngest. That bodes well for the future of evangelicalism. 1945 marks the entry of Wilbur Smith's volume, Therefore Stand, into the publishing field. It proved to be the harbinger of a veritable flood of apologetic works from the evangelical point of view. In 1947, Carl Henry exploded on the scene with his volume, The Uneasy Conscience of Modern Fundamentalism. In that volume, he pointed out that the withdrawal of evangelicalism from the public scene denied the heritage of evangelicals from the past, and it was antithetical to biblical teaching. Fuller Theological Seminary at its founding represented a clear step forward. I can still remember the day Carl Henry walked into the office we shared as instructors at Wheaton College. He relayed to me the still super secret plans to form a new evangelical seminary that would draw the best of evangelical scholarship from around the world in defense of the traditional evangelical faith. In 1949, the Evangelical Theological Society was formed at Cincinnati, Ohio, drawing together 
under one banner, fundamentalists and evangelicals united to foster evangelical scholarship. In 1950, Billy Graham burst upon the American scene. For the first time in years, he gave to evangelicalism a dignified public voice. He sought to pull together those who hold to the basic principles of evangelicalism rather than to accentuate the differences that divide them. Then in 1956, Christianity Today launched an evangelical fortnightly for the defense and propagation of evangelical faith. Under the leadership of Carl Henry, it also provided a banner under which scholars as well as pastors and lay Christians could sail. Meanwhile, liberalism was having troubles of its own that indirectly tended to foster the growth of evangelicalism. Six major denominations dominated by liberalism lost four million members and their overseas missions declined by two-thirds in the course of one generation. Meanwhile, came the rise of the Pentecostals and Charismatics. To many independent groups, old or small denominations, stayed mainline denominations, they brought a renewed emphasis upon the gifts of the Spirit, an important role for the laity, and the responsibility of the laity for an effective witness to Christ in every community. In the mid-60s, a dramatic shift occurred in the Roman Catholic Church in the United States. This is perhaps the most startling change on the religious scene of the last half century. Since then, Roman Catholics are much freer to listen to Protestant sermons over the radio and television. This last change points up a very significant aspect of evangelicalism that came into prominence in the late 60s and 70s. Radio and television programs sponsored by evangelicals especially by evangelical charismatics. The effect has been to introduce a core of evangelicals within the Roman Catholic Church, and many have affiliated with evangelical churches. In 1976, American evangelicals began timidly to re-enter the public square. The oddest thing about this is, perhaps, that those who did so most enthusiastically were not from the left wing or center of the evangelical stream, but the extreme right. Thus far, I've not even referred to the resurgence of evangelicalism outside of North America. In Central and South America, it has made unbelievable strides forward. And it is reckoned that more than 50% of black Africa, that is, Africa south of the Sahara, is now Christian. Statisticians have calculated that if the present tendencies continue by the year 2000, there will be more evangelical Christians in Africa than on any other continent unless that place is taken over by China. Herbert Kane, missionary statistician, argues that 50 million is probably too low an estimate of the number who have confessed Christianity in mainland China. This is the greatest influx of believers into the Christian church by confession of faith anytime, anywhere in 2,000 years of church history. Still, we must admit that not all is sweetness and light in evangelicalism. The antics of some well-known TV promoters have besmirched the reputation of evangelical leaders. The problem of educating our young in spiritual and moral values remains unanswered. In some measure, evangelicals have returned to the marketplace, but with no clear philosophy of politics to guide them. Such a philosophy is desperately needed. As evangelicals, we are committed to freedom. When we oppose pornography and free abortions, we need to make plain that we are thoroughly committed in principle to freedom and to justice only freedom and justice for all, and not just for some. Nevertheless, Americans aren't witnessing in a completely hostile environment. We are sowing the seed of the gospel in well-prepared soil, soil prepared by the history of Western culture and by the history of our nation. The recent poll on religion in America, just released a week or so ago by the City College of New York, only confirms what Gallup has been telling us all along that we live in a nation that has a tremendous spiritual heritage. This represents a golden opportunity 
for evangelical Christians. We live in the midst of a spiritually hungry people who are starving for want of spiritual food. They may not know that they are starving. They may and often do misinterpret their hunger, but hungry they are nevertheless. Where then is the evangelical church going today? Whatever else may be true, it is not in worldwide retreat. Our nation, perhaps the world, is at one of those hinge points of history. Doors could swing open to the gospel and to the strengthening of biblical morality and biblical values, or they could swing shut for a century, perhaps forever, for our nation and our society. It won't be easy, and it won't happen by accident nor can we drift into a better day. No craft ever drifts upstream. We shall have to work for it. We shall have to struggle. It will take a stronger and deeper conviction that my generation was prepared or willing to make, but it will be right. It will be honoring to God, and it is the only way we can claim the promise of God's victory. We dare not, like Nero of old in the pagan world, fiddle while America and the world spiritually go down in flames. We dare not be busy here and there doing this little good thing or that, but fail to be obedient to the Lord of the church and thus lose the pearl of great price. God have mercy on evangelical churches if we fail him at this momentous time in church history. I do not fear the tumultuous, threatening world about us. It is only a sick and helpless giant that needs the gospel. Its wounds need to be bandaged, and its hurts need to be healed. That is our task, and it needs to be done. I long to be the instrument of God's love and his peace to the desperately needy and suffering world all about us.